Purgatory, Part 2, Chapter 18 Relief of the Holy Souls We must not omit to recount the special grace which the great charity of St. Malachi towards the Holy Souls procured for him. One day, being in the company of several pious persons, and conversing familiarly on spiritual matters, they came to speak of their last end. If, he said, the choice were given to each one of you, what hour and what place would you like to die? At this question one mentioned a certain feast, another such an hour, others again at such and such a place. When it came to the saint's turn to express his thoughts, he said that there was no place where he would be more willing to end his life than in the monastery of Clairvaux, governed by St. Bernard, in order that he might immediately enjoy the benefits of the sacrifices of those fervent religious. And as to the same time, he preferred, he said, the day of all souls, that he might have part in all the masses and all the prayers offered throughout the entire Catholic world for the faithful departed. This, his pious desire, was gratified in every point. He was on his way to Rome to visit Pope Eugene the Third, when arriving at Clairvaux a little before All Saints. He was overtaken by a serious malady, which obliged him to remain in that holy retreat. He soon understood that God had heard his prayers, and cried out with the prophet, This is my rest for ever and ever. Here I will dwell, for I have chosen it. Psalm 131 In fact, the day following All Saints, whilst the whole church was praying for the departed, he rendered his soul into the hands of his Creator. We have known, says the Abbe Postal, a holy religious, Sister Zenaid, who, afflicted with a frightful malady for seven years, asked our Lord for the grace to die on the Feast of All Souls, towards whom she had always had great devotion. Her desire was granted. On the morning of November the 2nd, after two years of suffering endured with truly Christian courage, she began to sing a hymn of thanksgiving, and calmly expired a few moments before the celebration of the Masses. We know that in the Catholic liturgy there is a special Mass for the dead. It is celebrated in black vestments, and is called the Mass of Requiem. It may be asked whether this soul is more profitable to this soul than any other. The sacrifice of the Mass, notwithstanding the variety of its ceremonies, is always the same infinitely holy sacrifice of the body and blood of Jesus Christ. But as the Mass for the dead contains special prayers for the holy souls, it also obtains special assistance for them at least at those times when the liturgical laws permit the priest to celebrate it in black. This opinion, based on the institution and the practice of the Church, is confirmed by a fact which we read in the life of the Venerable Father Joseph in Chieta. This holy religious, justly surnamed the Wonder Worker of Brazil, had, like all the saints, great charity towards the holy souls in purgatory. One day during the octave of Christmas, when the church forbids the celebration of Requiem Masses on the 27th of December, Feast of St. John the Evangelist, this man of God, to the great astonishment of all, ascended the altar in black vestments and offered the holy sacrifice for the dead. His superior, Father Nerogra, knowing the sanctity of Enchitia, doubted not that he had received a divine inspiration. Nevertheless, to remove such conduct, the character of irregularity, which it appeared to have, he reprimanded the holy man in the presence of all his brethren. What, Father, said he to him, do you not know that the church forbids the celebration of Mass in black today? Have you forgotten the rubrics? The good father, quite humbly and obedient, replied with respectful simplicity, that God had revealed to him the death of a father of the society. This father, his fellow student at the University of Cumbria, and who at the same time resided in Italy, in the college of the Holy House of Loreto, he had died that same night. 
God, he continued, made this known to me and gave me to understand that I should offer the holy sacrifice for him immediately and do all in my power for the repose of his soul. But, says the superior, do you know that the mass celebrated as you have done will be of any benefit to him? Yes, modestly replied Enchitia. Immediately after the memento for the dead, when I said these words, To thee, God, the Father Almighty, in the unity of the Holy Ghost, all honor and glory, God showed me the soul of that dear friend, freed from all its sufferings and ascending to heaven, where his crown awaited him. Purgatory, Part 2, Chapter 19 Relief of the Souls Through the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass We have just spoken of the efficacy of the Holy Sacrifice in relieving the poor souls. A lively faith in this consoling mystery inflames the devotion of the true faithful and so smooths the bitterness of their grief. Does death deprive them of a father, a mother, a friend? They turn their tearful eyes towards the altar, which affords the means of testifying their love and gratitude towards their dear departed ones. Hence the numerous masses which they cause to be celebrated, hence also that eagerness to assist at the holy sacrifice of propitiation in favor for the dead. The Venerable Mother Agnes de la Sang, a Dominican religious of whom we have already spoken, assisted at Holy Mass with the greatest devotion and encouraged her religious to a like fervor. She told them that this divine sacrifice was the holiest act of religion, the work of God by excellence, and reminded them of Holy Scripture, Cursed be he that doth the work of the Lord deceitfully. Jeremiah 48.10 a sister of the community, named Sister Seraphonique, died. She had not paid sufficiently attention to the solitary advice of her superior, and was condemned to a severe purgatory. Mother Agnes knew this by revelation. In an ecstasy, she was taken in spirit into the place of expiation, and saw many souls in the midst of flames. Among them she recognized Sister Seraphonique, who in piteous accents, entreated her assistance. Touched with the most lively compassion, the charitable superior did all in her power for the space of eight days. She fasted, communicated, and assisted at Holy Mass for the dear departed sister. Whilst in prayer, with many tears and sighs, imploring the divine mercy through the precious blood of Jesus, that he would be pleased to deliver her daughter from those dreadful flames and admit her to the enjoyment of his presence. She heard a voice which said to her, Continue to pray. The hour of her deliverance has not yet come. Mother Agnes persevered in prayer, and two days later, whilst assisting at the holy sacrifice, at the moment of the elevation, she saw the soul of the sister Seraphonique ascend into heaven in a transport of joy, this consoling sight was a reward of her charity, and inflamed anew the ardor of her devotion towards the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Christian families who possess a spirit of lively faith take it to their duty, according to their ranks and means, to have a large number of Masses celebrated for the dead. In their holy liberality, they exhaust their resources in order to multiply the suffrages of the Church, and thus give relief to the holy souls. It is related in the life of Queen Margaret of Ostia, wife of Philip III, that in one single day, which was that of her obsequies, there were celebrated in the city of Madrid nearly 1,100 masses for the repose of her soul. This princess had asked for 1,000 masses in her last will. The king caused 20,000 to be added to it. When the Archduke Albert died at Brussels, the pious Isabella, his widow, had 40,000 masses offered for the repose of his soul. And for the entire month, she herself assisted with the greatest piety at 10 each day. One of the most perfect models of devotion to the holy sacrifice of the mass 
and of charity towards the souls in purgatory was Father Julio Mencinelli of the Society of Jesus. The masses offered by this worthy religious, says Father Rossangioli, appeared to have a particular efficacy for the relief of the faithful departed. The souls frequently appeared to him to beg the favor of a single mass. Cesar Costa, the uncle of Father Mancielli, was Archbishop of Capua. One day, meeting his holy nephew, very poorly clad, notwithstanding the severest of the weather, he with the greatest charity gave him an alms to procure for himself a cloak. A short time afterwards, the Archbishop died, and the father going out to visit the sick, wrapped in his new cloak, met his deceased uncle coming towards him enveloped in flames, and begged him to lend him his mantle. The father gave it to him, and no sooner had the archbishop folded it about him than the flames were extinguished. Mancinelli understood that this soul was suffering in purgatory, and that asked his assistance in return for the charity exercised in his regard. Then taking back his cloak, he promised to pray for the poor suffering soul with all possible fervor, especially at the altar. This fact became noised abroad, and produced such a solitary impression, that after the death of the father, it was represented in a painting, which was preserved at the College of Menserata, his native place. Father Julio Mancinelli is there seen at the altar clad in the sacred vestments, he is elevated a little above the steps of the altar to signify the raptures which he was favored by God. From his mouth issue sparks, the emblem of his burning prayers, and of his fervor during the holy sacrifice. Under the altar is seen purgatory, and the souls receive in the benefit of his suffrages. Above, two angels pour forth from costly vases a shower of gold, which indicates the blessings, graces, and ransoms granted to the poor souls in virtue of the holy sacrifice. We also see the mantle spoken of in an inscription in verse, which translated reads, O miraculous garment, given as a protection against the severity of the cold, and which afterwards served to temper the heat of fire. It is thus that charity gives warmth or refreshment according to the sufferings which it relieves. Purgatory, Part 2, Chapter 20 Relief of the Souls Through the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass Let us conclude what we have said relative to the Holy Sacrifice by what St. Teresa relates concerning Bernardino de Mendoza. She gives the fact in the Book of Foundations, Chapter 10. Of the Feast of All Souls, Don Berendino de Mendoza had given a house and beautiful garden situated in Madrid to St. Teresa, that she might found a monastery in honor of the Mother of God. Two months after this, she was suddenly taken ill and lost the power of speech, so that she could not make a confession. Though she gave many signs of contrition, he died, says St. Teresa, very shortly afterwards, and far from the place where I then was. But our Lord spoke to me and told me that he was saved, though he had ran a great risk, that mercy had been shown to him because of the donation to the convent of his blessed mother, but that his soul would not be freed from suffering until the first Mass was said in the new house. I felt so deeply the pains this soul was enduring, that although I was very desirous of accomplishing the foundation of Toledo, I left it at once for Valadid on St. Lawrence Day. One day, while I was in prayer at Medina del Campo, our Lord told me to make all possible haste for the soul of de Mendoza was a prey to the most intense sufferings. I immediately ordered the masons to put up the walls of the convent without delay, but as this would take considerable time, I asked the bishop for permission to make a temporary chapel for the use of the sisters which I had brought with me. This obtained, I had mass offered, and at the moment I left my place to approach the holy table, 
I saw our benefactor, who, with hands joined and countenance all radiant, thanked me for having delivered him from purgatory. Then I saw him enter heaven. I was more happy as I did not expect this. For although our Lord had revealed to me that the deliverance of this soul would follow with celebration at the first Mass in the house, I thought it must mean the first Mass when the Blessed Sacrament should be reserved there. This beautiful incident shows us not only that the efficacy of the Holy Mass, but also the tender goodness with which Jesus interests himself in the favors of the Holy Souls even condescending to solicit their suffrages on their behalf. But since the divine sacrifice is of such value, it may be here asked if a large number of masses procures for the souls more relief than the smaller number, whose defect is supplied only by magnificent obsequies and abundant alms? The answer to this question may be inferred from the spirit of the Church, which is the spirit of Jesus Christ himself, and the expression of his will. Now the church advises the faithful to have prayers said for the dead, to give alms, and perform other good works, to apply indulgences to them, but especially to have holy masses celebrated, and to assist thereat. While it's given the first place to the divine sacrifice, he approves and makes use of varied kinds of suffrages, according to the circumstances, devotion, or social condition of the deceased of his heirs. It is a Catholic custom, religiously observed, for the remotest antiquity to have Mass celebrated for the dead with solemn ceremonies, in a funeral with as much pomp as their means will allow. The expense of this is an alms given to the Church, an alms which, in the eyes of God, greatly enhances the price of the holy sacrifice and its satisfactory value for the deceased. It is well, however, so to regulate the funeral expense, that a sufficient sum be left for a certain number of masses, and also to give alms to the poor. That which must be avoided is to lose sight of the Christian character of funerals, and to look upon a funeral service less as of a great act of religion than a display of worldly vanity. What must be further avoided are the profane mourning emblems which are not conformable to Christian tradition, such as the wreaths of flowers with which, at a great expense, they load the coffins of the dead. This is an innovation justly disapproved by the Church to which Jesus Christ has entrusted the care of religious rites and ceremonies, not exempting of funeral ceremonies. Those of which she makes use of at the death of her children are venerable by all antiquity, full of meaning and consolation. All that presents itself to the eyes of the faithful on such occasions, the cross and the holy water, the lights and the incense, the tears and prayers, Breathe compassion for the holy souls, faith in the divine mercy, and the hope of immortality. What is there in all this in the cold wreaths of violet? They say nothing to the Christian soul. They are but profane emblems of this mortal life, that contrast strangely with the cross, and which are foreign to the rites of the holy Catholic Church.